Um, fill out that poll. I'm going to get started because when we were chatting backstage, Chris was saying that he has created brand new content for our audience and there's lots of information in here. So he over delivered. He's going to share a lot of info for you. And so I want to pass that mic over to him as quickly as possible because um, that's why you're here. We want to learn about how we can grow and engage our, our audiences using email. <laughs> And if you are new here, I am Sam. I have the pleasure of moderating and helping to host this webinar series from Safety Wing. All of our webinars that we've been doing basically once a week for the last three months are all on our YouTube channel. So definitely go watch some of the replays. We've had amazing guests and experts like Chris come in and share their tricks and their expertise to help all of us, you know, grow our audiences, monetize our lives. So ultimately we can have more freedom and flexibility, uh, which is one of my number one values. So today we have Chris Chera who is the creator and chief deal finder at Remote Base, an email newsletter serving over 3,000 digital nomads and traveling remote workers. Chris is a self-proclaimed newsletter nerd and was ranked a top 50 remote enabler from the 2022 Remote Influencer Report. Chris has built and monetized his email list with no prior knowledge of email marketing technologies while traveling the world as a digital nomad. So welcome, Chris. Thank you for being Thank here. <clears throat> and we are going to do some Q&A at the end. We'll save a little bit of time there. So as you're going through the presentation today, if you have questions for Chris, if something's not clear, you want to go deeper in something, definitely use that Q&A box. I'll be here the whole time monitoring the questions and I'll come back at the end. We'll do a little bit of a fireside chat with all the questions that you have for Chris today. If you are new here, then we want to take a second to let you know that Safety Wing is the company behind this webinar series. And Safety Wing has a vision of building a global social safety net for remote workers and nomads. So, you know, Chris and I are both doing the digital nomad life. I imagine many of you on the call today are living this lifestyle as well. And so Safety Wing is creating a suite of products with all of us in mind. Um, most notably, Safety Wing is the creators behind Nomad Insurance, which is affordable and flexible travel and medical coverage for you to benefit from anytime you're working, traveling, living outside of your home country. And so the mission is to create a home country on the internet for all of you and just make sure that you're covered as we pursue, you know, more freedom and flexibility. Nomad insurance, it works like your favorite, favorite subscription every month. You're charged without having to worry about, hey, if I'm, you know, last minute going to three countries this month or staying put, no matter where you are. Um, you'll know you're covered. So that is just one product. There's a number of other products that Safety Wing has created as well. So with all that said, I'm going to pass it over to you, Chris, to kick things off for us more officially. And while you're getting your screen loaded, let's see how that poll is doing. Let's look. I will ask you to uh, confirm for me when, when I have the correct screen share stuff up. Um, Looks great to me. Do you also see All the right. result of those polls? We had two questions do. today. Oh, interesting. Okay. So a lot of people are finding that time, time is the blocker for them. Okay. But no one's worried Girls. about the effort. So that means you got yeah. an audience here who's ready to put in the work and you're just going to give them the skills. That's good. <laughs> Roll up your sleeves, guys. It's time to go to work. Um, we're going to make this, hopefully we're going to, you're going to leave this feeling a lot less daunted by the time aspect of it. Um, cool. And then good audience sizes too. All right. This is good. Thanks for sharing, everybody. That's, that's super useful. I'll try to tailor some of this to, 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 yeah, to what, you're, what you need. Um, okay. So let's, let's roll into this then, hey. Um, obviously, we had a, a really nice... Um, introduction there from Sam. I'm Chris. I'm here to talk to you about engaging and growing with email. Uh, so thanks for coming along. Um, I think it kind of goes without saying that 
I'm, I'm a big fan of newsletters. Um, I think email newsletters are, are kind of like these rocket ships for audience uh, connection and audience growth. And basically all of that compounded with your current online presence, I think can, can really help you um, win, win in business, win in life. Um, but you're probably asking, or if you're still asking, you know, who's this guy, what gives him the right to, to talk about this stuff? Um, even after Sam's very flattering uh, introduction, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about the journey that I went on. So, you know, newsletters in general are kind of looked at as having four kind of stages of growth. First up is like zero to 100, um, the first 100 people. Then you go about 100 to 1,000, and then 1,000 to like 10,000, and then 10,000 and up. So the difference between 10,000, the growth between 10,000 to 100,000 and 100,000 to a million, it's not really that different. Those two categories uh, use a lot of the same techniques. So... Uh, if you're here, you know, if you're here, you're probably looking at the first two stages if you're getting started. And these are the stages that I've done. I've done them and I've done them very recently. So I'm also currently working through like stage three and, and learning lots of le lessons there. Um, and so I kind of like to think that this makes me not a guru. Like I'm not somebody with millions of newsletter subscribers. All of the stuff that I've learned, I've learned very recently. It's not like I learned it a long time ago and, and it's now not relevant or I've forgotten about it. Um, it's still, it's very recent. It's still still very relevant um and it's also worth saying that my newsletter remote based um before it was a business it was it was a project or a hobby you know it was something that i did for fun and that meant that i had a lot of time and uh, a lot of kind of flex i was able to to experiment with it and, and flex things around and test different stuff and learn basically what worked and this was important because um most newsletters are kind of part just part like one part of a wider online presence might be part of your kind of um your, your wider content kind of engine um, or your presence online for me that was very different it was the newsletter is the business and the business is the newsletter those two things are one and the same and so i had to learn fast i had to get really really deeply interested in like how newsletters work um and there was this period of accelerated learning thankfully i really enjoy this stuff um i'm 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 a newsletter nerd, uh, as, as Sam, <laughs> Sam mentioned in the introduction. Um, and that's kind of what's led us here today. And that's kind of who I am, how I've ended up being here today to give this stuff to you. So what I'm gonna give you, um, well, I'm gonna give you hopefully some gifts, some nicely packaged gifts. I'm gonna talk to you about why I think email is really special. I'm gonna talk to you about how to do email right um, with email capture content to include and the kind of tools and the tools to, to make it happen. Um, I'm also going to leave you with like a basic do and don't list. And I'm also going to give you the opportunity to maybe get some help with your newsletter moving forward. Um, I'm not going to cover uh, like really, really in-depth system, system setup stuff because there's just too many combinations to go like deeply enough for anybody to get any value out of that. And I'm also not going to cover like writing tips. I'm not going to talk about um, like how to be a writer because I just think there's enough tools or resources and courses and guides and things like that already available um so i'm going to let those things do their job and i'm going to teach you this stuff um i just want you to walk away basically knowing the value of a newsletter and having a better idea how you can go and get started and just crush it um so this is kind of for people who already have an audience or a community online um it's okay if you don't you'll still get lots of valuable stuff out of it but I think that your people who will get the most value out of this uh, will be people with who already have an, some existing audience or community or, or customer base, and they're looking to like forge deeper connections and create super fans with those people. Um, a quick note here on like what I'm calling visual people versus wordy people. Um, wordy people being bloggers and writers and people who are good with words and use words and are happy in that world, and visual people being like video creators. So you know whether that's Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, whatever. They're the visual people. I think wordy people will get value out of this, but I think visual people will get more value out of it, again, because there's just more stuff already available for wordy people transitioning into the newsletter world, opposed to visual people who might be a lot happier just kind of like staying in their comfort zone with, with creating TikTok videos or um, wherever it is that your skills lie. Um, this is for people who don't get newsletters um, and don't quite understand how to make it work for them. Um, but it's also for people who do kind of understand a little bit and want to learn some more and they, they think that they don't have the time or the skills, which are the two things that came up in the poll. So I'm glad that, that uh, those things connect. Um, 
and that's kind of it so that's the full foundation i think now we can just completely get stuck in and basically start with the first key question which is like why is email so special you know email's been around since like the 70s um and every, back then everyone i'm pretty sure everyone thought it was pretty special right it was new it was revolutionary it was it was the cutting edge technology um and so maybe a better question is not what's so special about email but a better question is what has changed about email because email used to be exciting and now it's a little bit more boring it's not really sexy anymore um at least that's what people think and that i think has a lot to do with the fact that now we have all of these rich content formats with social media you can get gifs on twitter you can get uh instagram reels or or, or viral tiktoks and, and really nice glossy youtube content and stuff like this and you're, you're essentially competing with um yeah you're competing with youtube and netflix right like long form high quality content because all of it is basically about attention we're just we're just looking to get somebody's attention for the newsletter um and all of that stuff being available like so re so readily available means that there's this road to of less resistance that that uh, readers or uh, out your audience can take they can get to nice stuff quickly and they don't have to pass their personal information their email address to uh, the netflix producers or the youtube um the youtuber or um, their favorite person on on twitter they can just kind of like hit follow hit subscribe um, and get access to all of this content and that's great it means that we get cool content all the time however it means that the personal information that you do have your email address is even more valuable and that's something that um is kind of glossed over a little bit like the this increasing value of, of an email given the ready the how readily available other content is um and that just kind of leaves us in this place where people are still really averse to newsletters and they think oh i don't have the time to write one or i don't feel like my writing would be good enough if i did one maybe it wouldn't be very good quality or like you know i i don't know how to use the technology or um i really want to do it but it's going to take me a long time to grow my list and um i i don't have the time for that and these are all obviously reasons why people don't do newsletters um it's probably not what you thought you were going to hear today so let's look at the other side of the coin let's look at the benefits okay benefits of a newsletter you own the audience pure and simple you're basically taking your audience off the platform which currently owns them and it's like rented space that you're taking from them and that's good because it means that you eliminate all of the competition right you're not competing in the same way you are with seo like when people want to find out about something you're not having to to rank you're just going directly to their inbox and they've given you permission to be there you're not trying to be the recommended YouTube video uh, and, and like messing around with like the Instagram algorithm. You're you're direct to the person. And it also means that you're not trying to compete with all of those other creators who are also creating YouTube videos or also creating Instagram posts or also tweeting. Um, I like to I like to think of this as like a what I call multi funnel. So it's like the newsletter can be an existing part of all of your existing online presence. You can plug into that um and, and be, a, be a functioning part of it but it also stands alone it stands completely by itself in terms of operation and execution and as a, as a revenue generating machine and the two just feed each other they can just feed each other all day long and you can grow and grow and grow and grow and grow so that's some of the benefits um and this is like this is proven right so there's tons of uh, email newsletters out there that have scaled into the millions and been acquired and, and done loads of, of you know crazy amazing business things um, I'm, I'm probably going to name drop some of them throughout if they're, if they're relevant, but here's just a few that you might know of just because of the sheer size of them. Okay, so really, really big section here just to kick us off. A um, little bit of a recap, like hopefully you can see some of the opportunity that exists with, <clears throat> with email. Um, and so with that in mind, you know, I want to go forward now and talk about how we can like actually make some of this stuff happen for you. So doing email right, capture, actually capturing emails. A newsletter is no good unless there's subscribers, of course. So subscribers, members, readers, followers, community, audience, whatever you want to call it. Let's look at getting these people signed up to your newsletter. I want to start by saying be prominent, okay? Um, try not to basically compete with yourself. Um, it's too many times where I go to a website or a blog I think this is amazing. Like, how can I get more of this? But the email sign up box is like tiny and is in the bottom corner, hidden away. 
and I have to go through all of the other content and I'm, I'm basically competing with that other content or the email is competing with all of this other content for, for users to find. Try not to do that, you know. If you're here and you're interested in newsletters and you, you kind of starting to understand the value of newsletters more, be prominent with that. Get it top, like get it right up there, right in the center for everybody to see. Don't compete with yourself. There's loads of stuff that you can look at for like building landing pages, optimizing landing pages. I'm not going to cover that today because again, there's lots of resources available for that and you can go really deep on that stuff. Um, and there's way more stuff for us to cover. Um, but that's the takeaway here, be prominent. Okay. Next up is lead magnets um, and like trying to in basically entice people to join. So you can offer lead magnets. Definitely recommend only ever doing this if it's truly, truly valuable content. Um, and if you're struggling to decide what valuable content looks like for your audience, then I recommend polling them. Run a survey, run like a, a, a LinkedIn poll. You can do a survey on Instagram. You can, you can do these things anywhere now and give them some options and say, here's like three things I think I could create for you guys. What do you like? What would be more valuable to you? And they'll tell you, they'll give you what they will find valuable and you'll be able to use that as a, uh, an exciting, enticing lead magnet. The other way you can do it is offer like exclusive content and say, okay, cool. Now I know what you guys are interested in. Join up to this newsletter and every week I'll give you a little bit of, um, a little bit of information or, or expertise on something in this topic. Um, and so that's a fantastic way to do it, which is slightly different from a lead magnet, which can sometimes feel a bit salesy. And that's something that I'll talk about a bit more. Um, I also want to talk about like getting creative um, and thinking about your newsletter capture as like, an evolving puzzle, like a, a puzzle that always changes, right? Um, you have to move the pieces of the puzzle around and figure out what works best for you and how to essentially get it to be optimized all the time. And it, it will constantly change and constantly change. So you can tweak the copy. You can add social proof and say, join 500 other um, food fanatics, like name the segment and say who it is that you're, you're targeting and who the existing readers are. Because if people identify with that, then they'll, they'll immediately feel like, okay, I need to be in on that too. I'm, I'm missing out because I'm a food fanatic and I'm, I'm not in there. Um, so get, yeah, get, get creative with the copy and tweak things. Um, and if you're drawing people in to your newsletter through social media, um, add, just add a call to action to absolutely everything. Whether it's the last tweet in a thread, if it's the caption of a video, uh, like if it's a Facebook post, like absolutely everything, make sure that people know it exists and constantly reminding them that they can go there and get this exclusive content or this lead magnet or whatever it is. Um, uh, there's a note here on kind of boring but important stuff. Um, so what I'll say on this is like most of the providers that you will use will cover a lot of this for you. Um, and we'll talk about some of those, but I just want you to be aware. I want you to be aware that this stuff exists. Um, there's like obligations that you have morally and potentially even legally, depending on where you're based. Um, and there's best practices around how, how, to, how to do this stuff. So you have to think about things like GDPR, if you're in the EU, you have to think about um, the, the CCPA, I think it's called if you're in the US. Um, and so like, just be aware of like updating website privacy policies and terms and having a double opt-in enabled, um, which help, you know, that'll help with like deliverability and stuff, but also uh, help you basically looking like a spam spam email all the time um and on spam you know on your landing page or wherever it is that you're trying to uh, attract readers state very clearly no spam or like we do not believe in spam we're not going to spam you um all of this all of this stuff some people will just point blank will refuse to sign up to stuff uh, unless you explicitly say that you're not going to spam them um you'll know your audience best so you know take your take your opinion on it but um be aware of those of those things um, there's one other thing that I want to say here about capture, but while I do this, I'm going to ask Sam if you can run, uh, the, there's another poll for you guys. Uh, I'm going to get that to, to pop up now. Um, if we can get that, I don't know if I can even hear Sam. Ah, there it is. Cool. So fill that in and let me know if you think that, uh, pop-up subscribe forms are annoying. Um, cause there's something that I want to say about this, which is I think quite key, but I want to get your, um, I want you to, to work with me here, okay? Um, so you looked into, I'm sure everybody here has been to a site, right? And you arrive on the site, and it's like, okay, cool, pop up, fine. 
but the 20 seconds path and you get another one and okay okay yeah or let me scroll to the content i want and you get you scroll down and you get your your content uh and then there's another pop-up and that's really annoying and eventually you know you, you get so annoyed that you try to leave and as you're leaving you get another one and it's just really annoying <laughs> um i know you guys agree with me this is this is uh this is good 79 percent of you think that uh pop-up subscribe forms are annoying i would tend to agree um there's an interesting the interesting thing to say about pop-up forms is that <clears throat> a lot of the positive um remarks about pop-up forms is that they help you optimize for conversion and i don't think that that's a lie i think that's true but i think it significantly damages the subscriber lifetime value um so over the long term it's actually worse so subscriber lifetime value is you know it's like what each subscriber is worth to you and it's it's the maths is like you know it involves how much time there is before a subscriber churns like how much time before they either disengage completely um and stop opening stop clicking or they just they passive they, they actively unsubscribe right um and it's that plus things like the revenue that you generate through sponsorships and affiliate links and product sales and premium memberships and all of those are the good things but if you have really really high converting pop-up form but the quality of that subscriber is is terrible because you've kind of coaxed them into subscribing and then they just disengage and and, and or unsubscribe you damage your subscriber lifetime value so that the implications are terrible in the long run and so i want to try and make the point that these are really annoying that that is bad business for for newsletters and you shouldn't do it um so thanks for sharing thanks for agreeing with me that they're annoying uh recap on this section is basically you know be prominent try not to compete with yourself offer exclusive content or lead magnets be creative like recognize the important things um even if they're a bit boring and don't be annoying so there's that key thing there about subscriber lifetime value so now you know a little bit about how to start setting up for effective capture now we can look at what goes into the actual newsletter okay we can talk about content and specifically right like how to how to optimize your newsletter and what kind of things you should consider if you want to build content that's that's successful you've got them to sign up that's the easy part now you need to deliver so structure um a lot of the times you know if if you're looking at uh, creating a, a newsletter building an email it's just a blank page and it's like where do i start think about the structure you could spend hours on it um you could spend hours building an email you could also spend hours talking about it but i won't do that i'm just going to give you a couple of options and tell you how those work and you can apply you know what you think is best based on your audience so option one is like curation um think about this as like splitting the email up into maybe four or five sections and having some exclusive content like a, a survey for your members um some you could highlight an, a member of your community or, or a member of your audience with user generated content you could have a sponsored section you can say like here's some relevant news that's been happening based on the topic that you talk about um and, and curate the best things to show to your audience and that's option one option two is like a bit more deep dive and a bit more kind of original content um so think about this as like a bit more words a bit more thought involved um arguably that there's there's higher higher value in this and i think this is where a lot of people see that um it takes time to to build it a new layer or, or to deliver one and it's the time that puts people off but there's ways around this you know you can you can especially now like tools like chat gpt you can you can have bullet points and you can get really really good structured uh, content and shit that in your newsletter there's nothing wrong with that and you can also blend these approaches you, know, you can do one week of original content one week of curation or just kind of shorter form original content with some curation you can blend it you know there's pros and cons to each structure and it's essentially going to come down to personal preference not just for you but for your audience you know your audience will have an expectation of you they'll know about your online presence already uh, everywhere else and they'll want to see something that matches so be cognizant of that with your structure once you have your structure and you start to ship emails then you need to consider uh, the engagement uh, how people engage with your content and how you can optimize for engagement so there's like four things that I want to talk about here um and they all link into how you can get clicks so 
engagement being measured in terms of clicks and in terms of opens. Opens used to be something that, that was kind of the primary measure of success to your newsletter. But now with lots of changes and um, adaptations to, to software and privacy policies and all of this stuff, clicks is actually a much stronger read of engagement for your newsletter. So try to gear everything towards clicks is, is, is the one takeaway. Four kind of ways we can do that. First one is cadence. How frequently you email somebody. Now you don't want to email them so infrequently that they completely forget you exist because then when you do email them, they'll be like, I don't remember signing up to this. Unsubscribe. That's not good. You also don't want to email them every day. Personally, I don't think that daily emails is, is a good route. A lots, of, lots of very successful newsletters do email every day, but I think there's a high chance that you're going to annoy people if you email them every day. Um, and again, just leads to unsubscribe. So start early. Um, or if you're starting early, go with um, like weekly or bi-weekly every two weeks um, and just kind of deliver high quality content. This is the second point is like quality content. And when I say quality content, what I mean is basically deliver the, <laughs> deliver the content that your audience expects, okay? Don't, um, don't under-deliver. This is, comes to the third point, which is don't over-promise. Um, unless you're a magician, um, be realistic, okay, about how often you can email and how much stuff you can actually put into your email. If you tell people you're going to email them um, every week and you only email them once a month, they're just going to be annoyed. It's just going to irritate people um, or they'll forget you exist and unsubscribe. Try to be realistic and don't overpromise. Um, it's really easy to burn that trust um, and it takes a long time to build it back up. So it's, it's just important. Um, and then the final point is around list hygiene. So uh, the broom here is to represent cleaning the list, um, which is where if people unsubscribe, you know, fine. If they unsubscribe, they will, they will sit on your account as a uh, like an inactive subscriber, and that's fine. Um, but it will it can kind of like make your your click rates and your open rates not feel so good because they're all measured in percentage terms, and so your click rates will come down. And it also helps with billing um, separately. Some uh, platforms will bill you for like uh, inactive subscribers. So it's better to clean them off the list. So yeah, um, you want to optimize and have like high click rates, high percentage click rates. And doing all of this stuff will help you have click rates. Um, I think, you know, I think the most important one on this slide is, um, is the in, isn't that quality content. And predominantly, uh, you can do you can do that a couple of different ways. In fact, we'll talk about this now in the next slide with um, with welcome sequences. Um, this is like the first impression that you get to make with your email newsletter. So it's really important that you are as nice as possible and get things started off on the on the right foot. Say hello to your audience, thank them for being there with you and supporting you, uh, and just be human. Um, write write like how you talk to them. Um, you want you basically want people to feel like you're their friend and you're just messaging them and if you do that i think this, it's important to do this even if you have a, a brand or a persona online which is very polished and very formal try to read it in a bit and be real and be um be a little bit more um, personable in the way that you you appear in their inbox it will help foster a deeper connection it'll help build them into loyal super fans and it'll help them click and engage with your, with your content um so one way you can do this in in your welcome email is to um, ask a question uh, and get people to reply to you. If you can do this, then this is like the, the best first step that you can take on your email journey, because when somebody responds to you, it adds them, adds you to their contact book, which means you will never go to the promotions tab or the, uh, you know, the spam folder. You'll be in their contact book then. And, and so the service providers will, will happily put your email through to them. Um, other things to be conscious of with your welcome sequence are things like lead magnets. Like so many times I see lead magnets um, kind of advertised as, as prizes for signing up to stuff, but then they're not delivered. So if you, <laughs> if you have a lead magnet, make sure you deliver it in the welcome sequence. Or again, you'll like burn that trust bridge. Um, and separately, like if you, even if you don't offer a lead magnet, I would like you to think uh, before you even get set up about, what you can offer as a potential lead magnet prize, because the best thing that you can do is like over deliver. Um, you don't want to over promise, but you definitely want to over deliver. You want people to sign up, expect nothing, and then for you to send them 
two or three things that are, would be really cool lead magnets. Um, because if you do that, it's like value straight away. You've shown them value, you're in their good books and um, yeah, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna engage with your content, they're gonna open the next email and so on and so on. Fantastic. Um, email welcome sequences are kind of the, the perfect entree to automated sequences um, because you can do it as a welcome email, but you can also do this in general as, as like a customer journey for people through your newsletter business. So how this works exactly will depend on the tech stack that you that you decide to implement and how you set, get set up with everything. Um, but for now, just consider like the world of possibilities when you can trigger uh, trigger an email, uh, trigger an email, have a user interact, and then based off of that, follow different paths. So you can like have somebody click a link in your welcome email and then go down this path of, of the next email and so on. Or if they don't click in it, then they go down another path uh, and the same with open. So if they open or they don't open, you can trigger different, different responses in, in the workflow. Um, and in practice, you know, this will depend on you and your content and your audience, like the kind of stuff that you, the kind of paths that you want people to follow, but think about it early. Think about how you can optimize for engagement and clicks through all of those different um, stages. Um, and then the other way to do that is with segmenting. So um, if you think about your contact list as exactly that, one big long list, you can segment it. You can cut it up into little baskets and say, okay, um, these people who had this behavior on this campaign, we're now going to target them with, with this, um, like let's segment that those people as a list and we'll just target them with this content so this is a way to essentially take all of the power of automations but instead of having to link it from the top level of an automation you can just kind of go well this has this campaign uh, performed let's take a segment of that um so it's really really powerful stuff you know i said i said at the start like email is really powerful i'm a big believer in it i'm hoping that as we go through this you're starting to see how this kind of power can be applied to you and to your audience and your community with email. Um, and that's all, it's all great, right? Cool, we can do all of this powerful stuff with email, but what does it all mean? Why is it all worthwhile? Well, monetization and growth, um, two big topics. Um, I'll talk about monetization first, and then I'll talk a little bit about growth. With monetizing, I wanna say, first and foremost, do not fear being salesy. Like there seems to be, um, there seems to be this idea often when I, when I talk to creators that, you know, if they have an email newsletter, they'll have to make it really salesy. And I don't really think that's true. You know, if somebody has opted in to this, they've, they've said that they want to hear more from you um, based on all of the good stuff that you already produce. So just do more of that. Like try not to overcomplicate this, you know, be, be authentic and valuable. And what I mean by that is do more of the same stuff. Um, if you show up in a certain way and have a certain style and a certain tone on, it doesn't matter whether it's Twitter or TikTok or anything else, like just apply that same style and tone into your newsletter and people won't, um, they won't be turned off by this. It'll be more of what they expect. It's when we veer away from the expectations that people will start to question why they're there. Um, and this brings me to the next point on monetization, which is um, doing this doing this if you have an existing audience uh if you have an existing audience and that audience is monetized then you can kind of recycle all the top performing stuff if you have a blog post that is killing it or if you have a, a youtube video that's doing really well great it doesn't matter if you have a curation structure or a deep dive structure um you can like recycle that back into your newsletter drive traffic back to that those posts that perform really well and kind of set the cycle off going again um so this will you know, this will, might boost you in, in whatever platform's algorithm, or um, it might drive more clicks to, to that thing that you're sponsored for, whatever it is. Basically do that, like try to get the ball rolling there. Um, that's kind of level one monetization. Level two monetization is around like brand sponsorships and partnerships. And I want you to take a second and just reconsider what brand sponsorships and brand partnerships could look like for you with a newsletter. Because more, a newsletter is essentially more impressions and more impressions is essentially more cash. So think about how you can basically level up out of, out of the realm of like YouTube personality or Instagram influencer to being 
a media brand and having a package and like a suite of um, impression opportunities for your brand uh, for your brand customers that you can offer and, and you can wrap those up different ways and there's different ways to kind of price things. Um, but that's I think that's a big like monetization play that a lot of people miss out on if they especially where they already have online audiences elsewhere. Um, talking about growth a little bit, I talked about quite a lot about monetization, so I'll try to keep it. Uh, keep it a bit tighter with growth. So growth um, early on, early growth, focus on cross promotion. So find a existing or similar uh, newsletter audience, like similar, but not competing and approach them and talk about collaboration and cross promotion. So, you know, you will, you will promote them to your audience and they will promote you to their audience and you can grow that way. That's really good for early stage growth. And once you get past like 2000 people, then you can start to introduce um, like incentivized referrals. So I'll talk a little bit more about incentivized referrals when we talk about tech stack, but um, that's an important one to remember there. So another big section, um, take a breath, take some water. Um, the, the recap is here for this. Mm. Real emphasis on kind of quality content here. I think with that in mind, everything else, everything else, fits in you know if you do quality content in your welcome sequence if you do it in your automations everything else follows fine so now we know how to get subscribers and we know the importance of email we know how to get subscribers and we know the con kinds of content that we want to share with them and so now we get to talk about tech stack um so i think most people look at it the other way around they go i'm gonna do a newsletter what tech stack am i going to use and then once they've decided on that, they start talking about content and, and, and the structure and all of this other stuff. But I've deliberately done this the other way around because if you have a view of what content you want to share with people, when you get to go and look at tech stacks, and you're making decisions about that, it'll be a lot smoother. Um, you actually be able to be opinionated about this stuff and make a good decision. So um, I could go full kind of newsletter nerd here and talk about all of the different options, but just, <laughs> there would never be enough time, I don't think. Um, so rather than going into like every possible combination, um, we're gonna look at like four, four elements to a successful newsletter tech stack. Uh, what you should consider as part of your kind of um, decision-making process and some examples. Um, so the first one is newsletter software. This is like, the, I, th I think this is what most people think of when they think of newsletters. It's like, oh yeah, you, you know, you use a newsletter tool for that. Um, but there are three other elements which we'll talk about. Um, but these are essentially um, essentially broken down by, by feature. A lot of people will assess them based on the features available, but also consider pricing because some, uh, some packages will have uh, pricing based on the amount of emails that you send. Um, and it doesn't matter how many contacts you have, or they'll have it either way around where you can have, um, you can have, you can send, they'll, they'll price it based on the list size, irrespective of the amount that you send. Um, and some will basically price on features and say, if you want access to these features, then it's a level up and you have to upgrade for that. Um, the other consideration that I would very much urge you <laughs> to consider is the actual experience of building an email. It's astonishing how, uh, how much time you can spend just looking at like, feature comparisons and stuff like this but i think more valuable is to just forget about all of that open an account like a demo account or a free plan and just go and try to build an email um based on the fact that you now know if you follow this kind of um this presentation you know roughly what kind of structure you want to have and things like that go and try and build one because the experience the email building experience and creating campaigns is so different across the different uh, platforms and you'll just have a preference um, like anything. So go and try and do that. And that, that'll give you a guide on what you want to use uh, over and above everything else. Um, there's also a, a note here on like technical knowledge. Um, some providers might expect you to have more technical knowledge than others. Um, again, most of them, most of the good software will do this for you. They'll, they'll be considerate of this stuff for you, but there's things to be aware of like, um, DMARC, which is domain-based message authentication and reporting and conformance. And this is basically an authentication protocol that stops you from getting spam stuff and like scam emails. Um, it's really, really important that this is all configured correctly because it affects deliverability. 
So you want it to, you basically want it to work. Um, if you're somebody who has the technical know-how, then you might want the flexibility to go and set this up yourself. If you're somebody who hasn't, then you will want it to be taken care of for you. So just be aware of these things and, and uh, consider that as part of your, um, your decision, you know? Um, I'll talk a little bit here about tech, the actual providers, the tech stack providers. Um, there's four that I, that I kind of like and, 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 and will, will recommend. Um, MailChimp is one of the biggest ones, probably one of the ones that people hear a lot about. Um, and there's tons of really powerful features, but sometimes people say that the UX isn't fantastic and the kind of building experience isn't great. But I urge people to look at that and just, like I say, test it for themselves because it's personal preference. Um, Made Light is a uh, another provider which is a lot cleaner in terms of the user experience, um, especially their kind of their, their visual builder is fantastic. Um, it's very, very, uh, yeah, it's very visual. Like the the automation, the way you can put flows together is is, is really clean and it's quite cheap. It's quite good value. Um, so don't be kind of confused by the name Made a Light. It's it's not like a light product. It's it's very kind of feature rich. Uh, so check that out. Um, with ConvertKit, ConvertKit is one that's very popular with bloggers and with writers, and they have an excellent, uh, if you have a lead magnet, they have an excellent landing page builder for like lead magnet landing pages. And they also have a, like from, for, from the aspect of monetization, they have this ad network. So if you have a ConvertKit mailing list, um, you can get plugged into their ad network and find sponsors that way. Um, and then there's Beehive. So Beehive is kind of this like cool new kid on the block. Um, they offer tons of stuff out of the box. Um, things like turning every existing campaign that you send into a blog post that will sit on, on your site, on your domain, which is great for things like SEO and driving more referrals over time, like more, more signups. Um, and they also have a referral system built in. Um, the guys who kind of created this business, they worked at Morning Brew, which is like one of the biggest, uh, most successful newsletters I think that there is. And they, uh, when they left Morning Brew, they went on to, to do this. So it's super cool. Um, they're building a lot of the, building this with a lot of the learnings that they took from Morning Brew. And it's super cheap. Like it's cheap at the, at the lower end of, of the subscribers, but even as you scale, you have a, uh, a much lower price point at scale, which some of the others, uh, it, it beats some of the other providers just on that alone. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. I have some affiliate links for these providers, um, which I'll, I'll pop them into the chat later. Like this is how we make, you know, content like this uh, possible. So if you want to go and check these out, please use the links. Um, and if you have any questions about them in particular, of course, come in and find me and, and, and ask questions. Um, that means we can go to the next slide, which is landing pages. So landing pages and subscribe forms. I'm going to assume that everybody knows what a landing page is, but if you don't, get in the chat. Um, subscribe forms, basically a fancy name for the text box that you put your email in. Um, and whether or not you are driving traffic to your newsletter via social media or you know whatever outside platform you're driving traffic from, Consider that irrespective of that, the landing page and the subscribe form is how people enter the newsletter. That's how they actually subscribe. Um, and all of the software that I've talked about, they'll have options for creating bespoke subscribe forms. Some of them will even have options for landing pages. I talked about ConvertKit and their cool uh, lead magnet landing page builder. Um, but I recommend that you do both, especially early on. Like try to have, uh, try to have some options, like have a landing page, embed a subscribe form on your blog or on your kind of uh, personal brand website or whatever it is and just test them out and see like which ones get the the in more traffic or higher converting uh, traffic um and tweak you know all of the tips that i talked about be prominent with it don't compete tweak the copy and find how the puzzle fits together for you um there's also some landing page builders which are kind of outside the realms of the specific newsletter uh, service providers. Um, so there's providers like Card and Tilda. Again, I can I can ship some links into the chat, but these are really good because um, they're just like cheap, fast, really, really simple, almost like idiot proof. 
um, and they integrate well with loads of tools. So they're excellent for building separate landing pages for stuff if you just want to test stuff out. Um, that's landing pages. Next up in the tech stack, this is element three. Uh, this is monetization. So talked before about like leveraging existing, existing uh, affiliate deals and, 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 uh, and brand sponsorships. Now with brand sponsorships, um, if you've got an online presence already, then you might be able to open conversations about your newsletter with, with those brands, but you can also use your expansion specifically into newsletters to win new brand partnerships and new brand sponsorships. There's dedicated platforms for this. So you can look at things like paved.com, um, they sponsored this newsletter, um, and there's also swap stack. There are three, three big ones, but there's lots. Um, and these are basically marketplaces where brands go to find newsletters to sponsor. So you just need to go and be on these platforms. And of course you can do it the other way. You can do like outbound stuff and message people. Um, if you want to do it that way, then I recommend a, a different platform, which is called who sponsors stuff. Um, which actually run, runs as a newsletter as well, but they, they basically find and they do with lots of spying, basically. They see who's sponsoring what newsletters and then they share who's sponsoring what newsletters. So you can see, you know, if, you're, if you have a sports newsletter or, or a nutrition newsletter, you can see what other nutrition newsletters are being, what companies are sponsoring other nutrition newsletters and you can sell your newsletter space to them. Um, so there's a whole kind of world around sponsorships uh, specifically for newsletters. And um, yeah, these platforms are going to be a major part in, of your kind of tech stack and how you how you turn yourself into this media brand, right? And, 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 and take your existing audience and your existing presence online and, and level it up to be this place where you can sell packages of, of media exposure. Um, that's element three, that's monetizing. Element four, the final element of tech stack is growth. So Earlier, talked about um, cross promoting and uh, cross promoting up to about 2,000 subscribers. Um, and you can do that with this really cool tool called Magic Link by a company called Spark Loop. Um, they offer this tool for free. Um, and it basically means that if you have a newsletter, I can give you a link to my newsletter and you can add that to your newsletter. And when people click it, they automatically subscribe to mine. They don't have to do like the double opt in stuff. Um, they just have this, they wave a magic wand and subscribe to my newsletter. Um, and once you go past 2000 uh, subscribers, then you can look at introducing referrals. So incentivize referrals and Sparkloop, this is what Sparkloop do is their paid product. Um, it's like platform agnostic uh, newsletter referral system. So when you go to a newsletter and they say, okay, if you invite three friends, we'll give you a t-shirt. If you invite 10 friends, we'll give you a, a keyboard, whatever it is, um, they use a system like this. So you can use that to incentivize referrals. And this is why things like your subscriber lifetime value is so, so important because you need to know what a subscriber is worth to you so that you can uh, essentially go out and package referral prizes that are within the confines of that, like financially and for it to make sense. Um, I would also say like, think ahead to this early on when you're surveying your subscribers, ask them what they would find valuable or what they would be interested in as a prize. Um, and that will incentivize more referrals. So this is it, another huge section, um, four elements of the tech stack, um, all there for you to see, plain as day, software for the newsletter itself, landing pages, monetizing and growth. I think we're very tight on time. So I'm gonna try and kind of wrap this up now um, with some newsletter do's and don'ts. Like you essentially already know, today um why it's important how to get people subscribed what content to include and now tech stack the do's and don'ts is like this is what i want you to take away if you forget everything else okay um in this slide you will not see anything about monetization and you will not see anything about growth because if you nail these things if you get the foundations right that stuff will figure itself out okay so just try not to overcomplicate it and do the simple stuff right and everything else will follow um and then finally there's like, there's some things to say about other newsletter stuff. So if you've liked this, if you've enjoyed this, then you're probably gonna love all of this other stuff. So you can Google for Ethan Brooks's presentation on newsletter trends, that will, will blow you away. It's, it's amazing, the stuff that he's done. Um, definitely check out Spark Loop, it's platform agnostic. Um, I talked about things like Magic Loop, but they also have other free tools, things like uh, 
calculators for pricing your uh, ad slots or calculators for determining what your subscriber lifetime value is. So they're really, really useful for anybody building a newsletter. Madrev will help you optimize your ad sales. Um, Dylan runs Growth Currency. So this is, this is a newsletter for people who are building newsletters and all of his content is fantastic. And then my, one of my personal favorites is uh, Why We Buy by Caitlin. And Caitlin is an incredibly intelligent lady. She talks a lot about consumer psychology and like buying behavior. And all of this stuff is super powerful uh, for your newsletter. If you implement this stuff, it, it, it's like rocket fuel. Um, and then there's me, of course, there's me here. Um, I'm in the trenches with you building a newsletter. Um, I might be a few steps ahead of you though. So, you know, I can try and help you if I can just ask questions, I'll, I'm here. And uh, yeah, full recap, you know, this is the stuff that I told you I was gonna talk about. I've talked about it. And now I'm telling you I've talked about it. Um, you should be able to, to go away and kind of implement some of this stuff now, you know, you know why it's important, you know how to do capture, you know how to do content. Um, and there's a lot of tech stack tools that are available for you to go and check out and you know what not to do. Um, with all of that in mind, I think there's only one kind of thing left to say, which is really, really big thank you to, to Safety Wing. Um, if you're not already on the Safety Wing Ambassador program, definitely go and check it out. Um, it could even be something that you decide to promote. Uh, you could promote Safety Wing products via your, your new uh, newsletter. Wouldn't that be exciting? Um, I'll also leave a link for that in the chat as well. And if you use uh, my link, then when you make your first referral, you'll also get a hundred dollar bonus. Um, and if you're a digital nomad, come and check out Remote Base. Um, you'll be able to sign up there for free and get curated accommodation with amazing discounts. And finally, you know, I've talked about newsletters extensively uh, for this time. And even now I just feel like I'm only just scratching the surface. So I'm actually working on a service right now, which is gonna be brand new and it's designed to help and support creators who want to add a successful newsletter to your existing online presence. So if that's something that's interesting, come over to chrischero.com. That's my like home on the internet. Um, come over there, say hello, and you'll be able to register and find out more about that service when it launches, you get early access, get a load of really good stuff. Um, and that's kind of it. I'm really, really conscious of time. So which I'll wrap it up and I'll see what questions there are in the chat and hopefully we can, we can go through some of those. Um, yeah, before we have to kind of wrap this up fully. Ooh. Great job. Do you need some water? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get it all out. I hope that was useful for people. No, it was so useful. Thank you so much. Everyone was quite engaged. People were so engaged where they were thinking, you know, I'm trying to listen. I can't take all of these notes. Will we get a recap of this? So yes, absolutely. We've been recording this. It will go up on our up on our YouTube channel and we'll also be emailing all of this information out. So questions around getting emails opened, right? So it's one thing to create an email list and to have all of these hacks to grow the list. It's another thing to make these amazing emails that are filled with affiliate links and are going to convert so well. Tips for actually getting someone to open an email and increase your open rates. Yeah, so you have to be really clever here with subject lines. Um, some platforms will um, have limitations, like I think, for example, MailChimp won't let you have an emoji in your name. So when you send an email from MailChimp, it has to be like, this email is sent from Brian, um, not like Brian with a smiley face and stuff like that helps you convert at that point. So yeah, there's like, I think these are like tricky tricks. Um, when you think about like subject line, um, subject line and preview line optimization, that's all about like direct response copywriting. So you, you have to basically make it so that people want to click in without it being salesy and scammy. And I think, to be honest, for me, the, be the best way that you can do this is protect yourself with quality content right from the start. So I know just from, you know, I subscribe to tons of newsletters because I'm really interested in like seeing how other people are operating them from the inside out. And there are some that I know, I know before I even click into them that they're going to be full of like horrible spammy content um because i clicked into the first one and that's what i got um and it, it just kind of like takes you on this path where you slowly slowly engage with it less and less and less and this is why it's so important to have high quality content straight away because you have to get set off on the right foot 
And this is why you have to have really good uh, lead magnets or really good high value content right from the first email. I think I, I cannot express uh, with words how important it is for the first email to be a good one. Um, because otherwise you go on that path of like people, even if you have a really, really good subject line, they question, even subconsciously, they question if they're going to get what they get in what they want to get if they click through. So the best defense is high quality content from the start. And the second best defense is sub, like optimizing your subject line. And the only way you can really know how to do that is to do it. Do it, see, see what works. You can even A-B test with some platforms. This is one of those features that's often a paid feature, but um, if your audience is big enough, then um, it'll, it'll pay for itself. That feature will, that feature will pay for itself. Hmm. And of course, A-B testing would be trying out a few different email subject lines to some of our list and seeing which one performed best. I'm sure you've done that a few times. What are some subject line hacks that you've learned from your own list? Like anything from, you know, I've heard lowercase letters. I've heard certain number of words, emojis, maybe asking a question, having an exclamation mark. What have you found with your own list? Yeah, so I, for me, emojis definitely works. Um, no more than 12 words seems to work better. Um, and I also, I also think that there's a trick around like consistency. So um, I always have like the same emoji in the same place or like use the start with the same three words um, or whether it's like how to X, Y, Z or um, here is da, da, da. And people kind of see like your name next to the emoji that they recognize with your brand and then the start of a sentence which they're familiar with. And if they get into this practice of like, it's just a habitual then that they open this email um, and that can help. Um, things like question marks, yeah, it, a general copywriting technique is that, that that's good. Um, I also like to, to use words like you, so speak directly to the, to the reader. Um, and there's other things like get or want, um, people seem to have this response to these words where like they, they do want stuff. They don't not want stuff. Everybody wants stuff. So, so they have to open it to, to, to get in and see what it is. Um, so these are just some tips, but I don't know some of those are questionable, you know, they might seem salesy and they might be, they might be deemed as on that salesy side of thing where people don't want to go. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Well, we could definitely tell you are a fan of emojis from that presentation. What is your <laughs> You said that you always try to use the same one in the same place. Yeah, so I use a, um, so the remote-based brand is like an R and a B in orange, in a big orange circle. Um, so I use the, like the big orange circle as the, the remote-based emoji. Um, so this is, if you follow me on LinkedIn or, or Twitter, any places like that, then you'll, you'll see that more. Um, so apologies in advance for the, the big orange circle that you see everywhere now. We'll get your attention, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> Final question, and this is in the chat from Brian, and Brian is asking about, do you need to use a tool to do a newsletter, or can you just type it into your favorite email provider and send out to your list? So kind of talk a little bit about some of the cons of doing that or pros of doing that, and then we'll wrap up there. Yeah, so I think you can do like, um, even Google now, they have this thing where they'll let you basically add multiple recipients and they'll, they'll, they'll send it off. Um, you know, they'll send it off separately so you don't have this big list where everybody can see everybody's email. Um, sure, I think, you know, that works. There's, there's also tools like, um, there's something called Stendy, which is like, it works off one of like Amazon's uh, like more technical email messaging services. Um, and it's like a layer on top of that. It really depends how technical you are. Um, a lot of the tools are basically just like fancy HTML emails that you can create really quickly with a visual builder. But if you're like a HTML genius um, and you're happy to kind of put in the work on that side of it, then yeah, like you'll be able to send emails for, you know, for, for free or for, for a lot, a lot cheap, a lot more cheaply. Um, but often, oftentimes, you know, the quality of the content being the, the killer thing and keeping people engaged is it's worth shortcutting your way to, to the kind of rich, the richer content format. Um, remember, you know, you're, you're competing with, opening an email or opening Instagram and going scrolling over there. So it kind of like, it kind of needs to be engaging visually. Um, so that, that would be for me, but I guess it depends on your audience, you know, Brian, tell us, tell us who your audience is. Maybe, maybe they are technical people who would love that. Um, so just be cognizant of this stuff. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. 
Yeah, I think it was great. And I know a lot of the other features that you've talked a little bit about today, segmenting your list, being able to track your open rates and all of those types of things, you'd need a tool most likely to track all of that, like MailChimp, right? So I think those are kind of the benefits from doing it that way. Sometimes if I am just an affiliate partner to a company, I'll just send an, an email to maybe like 30 people that I think it's relevant to. And in that case, you know, I'll just think of them and, and do a quick email from Gmail and, and send my referral link. But for the most part, I'm, I'm trying to use these tools as much as possible. So I learned a lot today as well. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm so happy. Um, I'm glad that you did. And um, like I say, if anybody's over there, then um, yeah, come and say hey to me on the internet. Let's be internet friends. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. We're going to wrap here. Thanks, guys.